All right, well, maybe we can go ahead, 502, probably go ahead and get started. Um, and Kelly will keep letting our folks in as they join us. So welcome to our fifth meeting of our task force. Um, we are appreciative that you're joining us um, this evening, another beautiful evening. So thank you for taking your time to be with us. Uh, we are going to start the meeting um, just reminding folks of our guiding principles. And, you know, you can review those quickly within your, um, in your groups. Um, but remembering that, you know, health and safety um, are prior is our number one priority, as well as following the guidance of DOH, CDC, as well as OSPI. And so that is going to be some of our work tonight, is talking about some of that guidance, as well as um, working on the OSPI um, questionnaire that they sent us for our reopening schools. So we'll spend some time talking about that, but we wanted to get a, an update as we begin our meeting from our superintendent, Dr. Linda Quinn. So um, Linda, I, I know you're on here somewhere. I just don't see you, but I'm going to ask that she go ahead and get us started for this evening. Um, Kelly, I don't see Linda in yet. Okay. She's not in as of yet. She's not in. All right. Well, that makes it hard to get that update, doesn't it? <laughs> so how about that I um, kind of introduce our work and Faye, if you wouldn't mind maybe just checking in on Linda and making sure that she has the invite. I know she's in her office. Would you mind doing that, Faye? Yep. All right, perfect. So I will go ahead and move to the next slide. I'm having some connectivity issues in my office this evening, so I keep freezing up. So I apologize if I'm lagging at all. And if I am, please feel free to let me know. Um, and Holly, if you want to make sure to tell me, Holly, you can tell me. <laughs> If I'm having trouble, Holly, you can tell me. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna share my screen and I just wanna go over kind of our agenda for the evening. Um, okay, so this is what we are going to spend the first hour doing is we are going to be meeting with our subgroups for the first hour. And then we're going to come back together and share out as a whole group. Uh, the facilitators, when we are with our subgroups, they're going to use the OSPI template questions for reopening, um, which will align with our, the work of your subgroup. So we have been given a template, and we've referenced this in previous meetings from OSPI regarding um, their expectations of us as a district and what is required for us to have in our reopening plan. And that has just been given to us within the last couple of weeks. So it wasn't in the initial template that we had sent to our um, facilitators. So we've broken out the template by subgroup category. And so we'll, you'll talk with your team about that um, template just to make sure that all of our teams are covering the expectations um, from that template. And then um, having some further conversations about your action plans. And then we'll come back together right about six o'clock and facilitators will be asking um, for volunteers uh, from each of the subgroups that'll be willing to share um, how we're doing on those questions. And we have specific questions that you will use um, when you're sharing out. So we'll give you kind of the template or the format with those questions. So we're asking that a volunteer from each of the subgroups be the one that represents your group when you share out this evening, as well as when we prep for our board, the board meeting next week. And then that person would also be part of our official um, school board presentation on the 18th. Mm -hmm. So once again today, first hour will be in subgroups and we're gonna be working on the OSPI template, um, which focuses on our reopening. And in, during that time, each subgroup will identify a facilitator that will share out your progress on those questions for tonight and also be the person that will be responsible for speaking on behalf of your subgroup both next week when we practice our school board presentation and then actually at the meeting on the 18th. And just, right. just, just to um, reiterate too, we know that you, we gave you templates to what to do your work off of um, previously. And so there will be many things probably or likely that you have worked on as a subgroup within that template that you've been operating under um, that might not be a part of the OSPI template, but we encourage you to pull the things out that you've been working on that you would like to um, also see um, included in some way, shape or form, or whether you just kind of highlight that that's, you know, something that your group is still working on or that we as a district need to continue to work on over the next couple of weeks, month, couple of months, 
Um, so just to recognize that we're not, you know, forgetting the work or negating the work that you have all put into it. Um, this is just what we have to officially report um, to OSPI for our reopening plan. And I believe Linda has joined us. Um, so I think. Kelly, is she here? I'm here. All right. Awesome. Here you are. So, so we explained, go ahead. Go ahead. Where well, I was just going to introduce, we had explained that you were just going to give this team a brief update. Um, and we reminded the guiding principles of our team has been, you know, health and safety, as well as, all, you know, ensuring that we are adhering to all the guidelines from our various support areas. So um, we said that you were going to give us a brief update. So late breaking news today um, at one o'clock, the um, seven superintendents in Whatcom County met with five officials from the Whatcom County Health Department. And Dr. Stern, um, who heads up the health department, let us know that he is issuing a letter today that um, strongly recommends that Whatcom County Schools do not, um, that Whatcom County Schools begin the school year serving all students in a distance learning model. Um, that based on um, based on some metrics, based on um, the trajectory of the trend line, based on um, growing number of cases in Whatcom County and coming up, it appears coming north. Um, and he is going to be publishing a press release to that effect this afternoon. And um, we've scheduled a school board meeting at seven o'clock right after this to share that information with, with our school board um, as, so that they can give us a, so they can tell it, give us a thumbs up, thumbs down to continue in that direction of planning for a full or pretty fully remote opening in September. Um, I share that with you because um, I thought maybe this group would want to provide a recommendation to the school board to either go along with that health department recommendation or some kind of mitigating, I, I don't know. Anyway, um, if the school board uh, tells us to act on the health department's um, strong recommendation, then we will probably put out news tonight or tomorrow that um, we'll be opening in a, in a full, pretty full on distance learning model. So questions, comments, recommendations from this group. None. Linda, what was the feeling from the other superintendents uh, in the, in Whatcom County? Um, well, the one thing that we agreed is that no one would speak for anyone else because everyone needs to go back and talk to their own boards. Um, but I, I think all of the superintendents felt that it would be pretty hard to um, go against strong recommendations from the local health official. Right using words like unsafe. So um, what we agreed is that everyone was gonna go back and process with their own task forces, school boards, leadership teams, and we'll be every, all of the districts will be coming out with something by the end of this week. Linda, I will say in, in my role, one of the key things that I'm asked to do is to mitigate risk. I think with the the health department making a strong statement like that, we would be exposing ourselves to a great deal of risk if we decide to do something other than to follow their guidance. Linda, does that apply to private schools as well or just public? It, we didn't really get into that that much, but since it's a strong recommendation, I'm sure, it, I'm sure it applies to everybody, 
but whether, you know, a strong recommendation is not like the governor's closing down school last, which wasn't a recommendation. Um, and we did that, we talked for over an hour about whether or not it should be a, um, an edict. Um, you know, I will, by law, there are three people who can close, and this isn't closing a school district. This is, but it's the governor, the county health official, or the superintendent. Um, in in our case, the the school board has been put in a position that, that's for emergency step, but to to approve our reopening plan, and it really isn't closing school. It's just the model in which we reopen. But um, uh, I I'm kind of with John. I don't know how we buck a strong recommendation for the health and safety of our constituents that we, it's, it's hard for me to think about doing something else, but I'm and just... I, I think, you know, as a parent also, it's nice to hear it earlier than later so I can start like preparing because I don't want my kid to be unsafe or the staff to be unsafe. Um, my only hesitation, which isn't really a hesitation, is just I'm worried about the levy. Oh, very worried about the levy. I mean, yeah, I hear you. Hi, Linda, thanks for that update. Um, I It makes sense to me following what's been happening around the nation and the world, and um, I wish I was surprised and I wish we could open, but I think safety does need to be, you know, on our list right now. And I'm just wondering if there's any way they could or you guys were given the information to share kind of how the health department got to that recommendation just to bring everybody kind of onto the same page i don't know if this task force would like to see i would be very curious but i'm sure other parents and probably the board may also like to see her or his um well he this is very recent and he's was he went off the meeting to write but i took notes um what this is some of verbatim we can't guarantee we will have numbers that will allow us to to open in-person learning the trajectory of community spread is going in the wrong direction um dr stern talked about the fact that um that the state may come out with a metric it hasn't been published yet but he and the other state officials met recently and said um, they were talking about 25 cases in the 25 cases per 100,000 of population in the last 14 days. If you had 25 or less, it would be safe to open. If you had 75 or more in the last 14 days, it would not be safe. You know, we should shut things down. And between 50 and 75 is sort of a gray area. Um, Skagit County is currently at 99 per 100,000. Whatcom County today, he said, was 63 per 100,000 with a, a trend line going up. And so what he's saying is it, there doesn't appear to be the behaviors that are going to change that trend line. And um, that if for, for planning purposes, it, it looks like we're going to be, and the, and those 25 and 75 aren't in law or hard and fast yet. There's also a website that shows by school district cases in the last um, 14 days. And unfortunately, we are the highest of the seven school districts. Um, the, the information posted today said we have had 140 cases in um, Ferndale. And granted, people move back and forth and all that, but 140 cases in the last 14 days. The next highest is Meridian with 121. These are per 100,000. So it hasn't really been 140. You know, those, that's extrapolated out. We don't have 100,000 people. But these numbers, 140, this is compared to the 75, which would be considered as sort of a threshold. 
Meridian at 121, Linden at 64, Nooksack at 72, Mount Baker at 57, Bellingham at 37, and Blaine at 23, which averages out to a countywide number of 63 per 100,000. Okay. So um, he went on to say that there's new research on the transmission by children, which has um, is influencing his decision he referenced a report called schools are not islands um he talked about um he talked about the fact that um we have a, we need to plan and if we're planning he was recommending erring on the side of caution um always hoping we are going to be wrong but he, he said several times the trend lines are moving in the wrong direction um, not only the number of cases, but the number of contacts per case is getting larger. Um, th that's about what I, and he, he did say there, there could be some opportunity for bringing some individual students back in customized exceptions that focused on mi minimizing disease um, spread uh, you know, small groups, special ed students, homeless students, whatever. So anyway, that that's those are the notes I took. Hey, Linda, this so is, hey, Linda, this is Lorette from the health department. And um, I, I can show some of those graphs if I can um, share my screen if anybody's really interested in looking at some of those. And we can show that the trend line is really on the rise. And, um, you know, we had the, the peak at the beginning and then we had the peak over Memorial Day and we came down really, really significantly. But for some reason in the last few weeks, um, the numbers have been going up again. And so I think it's, you know, the community um, needs to get behind this. If they want schools open, I think the community as a whole um, needs to respond by um, following the directions of distancing and masking and things like that. But um, I think I can share if that's okay, if you want to see some of that, or I'm happy to answer any questions if I um, want some clarification or any further information. Thanks, Lorette. I didn't see you. Lorette was in the meeting, so she can fact check me. You, nope, you did great. You did great. So yeah, that's definitely, um, there's a draft on the school decision tree, and that was the metrics that Linda was talking about. Um, 75 cases per 100,000 over 14 days um, is kind of the limit to say remote learning is recommended. And we're in the about 62 and a half or 63 right now with the trend going up. So, um, so that really doesn't bode well to see what, you know, it's like weather forecasting, Dr. Stern said, you know, we can see the trend is going up and hurricanes headed our way. And, you know, but we don't know if it's actually gonna hit land you know, so it's those kinds of things of trying to predict. And um, the best that we can look at is the way that it, the trajectory is, and the trajectory is up. I have a question um, with regards to these charts. And I mean, I understand that it can go exponential so that when you have 70 out of 100,000, it sounds like a very small number. That's mm -hmm. like one in a thousand. But is there any sort of way that the health department can help us show people how exponential spread works? Because those sorts of numbers, they'd be like, oh, it's less than one in a thousand, don't worry about it. But if you open up a school district that has four and a half thousand people in it, and you start with those few cases, where we would be two weeks later. And I think that sort of understanding of what these small, numbers look like now what they could be in a month or a month and a half or even if we wanted to take it out to deaths mm -hmm. that this is a decision that the school board has to make that could end up with multiple people from our school district whether they're teachers students or family members dying and that's huge everybody looks at it just these small numbers right now mm -hmm. I, and i agree i think you, i put the link to our, our data um, in the chat, and I think you can dive in there a little bit and get and look at that. What the the R not number 
you know, the replication number is above one at this point. So we want it to be below one. And so looking at those types of numbers of seeing that, you know, it's an exponential growth. It's not just, you know, one. So every person that gets COVID, you know, how many more get, get it, how many more is it spread to? So um, that is in some of those, those charts and things on the, our website, if you want to um, dig into those. And I'm happy to, to look around for a little bit more, you know, um, illustrative. Yeah, have some, yeah, illustrative. Exactly. Um, because like an R naught number, mm -hmm. I mean, for Sarah, Sarah knows exactly what an R naught would be. But I think for somebody who just wants their kids back in school, exactly. and, you know, springtime didn't work for them or something like that, mm -hmm. um, we need a visual type of thing that really gets away from charts, graphs, yeah. science numbers, and maybe just shows stick bodies. And, you know, there's six to seven out of 100,000 this week, but one month from now, if we don't change things, mm -hmm. or if we open up schools and we increase the number of contacts, what happens? We just need something that's very visual sure. as opposed yeah. to scientific. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a look and I'll talk to our um, information officer and see what they've worked on as far as like illustrating, um, you know, the trajectory of illness and, and I'll see what we can, can, um, we can work up for you. I think that's a really good idea. We need to bring it down so people can understand it, you know, that what these numbers actually look like, you know, for us. Would it be possible to have something when it needs to? I didn't, I didn't get all that. No. I'm not sure who's talking even. I believe it was Ron. Ron. Any other questions? Comments, recommendations. Hey, Linda, this I is just Paul think, Officer. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah. Did y'all discuss anything about transportation assets and? Um, no, not at this. The, not at the point. Okay. Not at this meeting. I know that's been part of the conversation that John and Mark have had with OSPI and with, I think, the Teamsters, but not at, not at the meeting today at all. Okay, thank you. Linda, I have one question. I just wanted um, to add, I think. Um, I was just wondering, I know that you said something about possibly like certain students being able to come in. Um, would that mean that even if we're in distance learning, maybe it could be like, office hours or IEP meetings um, at the school, or is that, we're not sure yet? There are, um, I'm not sure yet, but that's one of the things that all of the superintendents talked about, about um, plans that we could make to safely bring back our students with the greatest needs. Um, but we need to talk to our teachers and our unions and our workforce and our but the health department did offer to work with us to customize options. Um, we talked about um, not all special ed students, but special ed students with the greatest needs. We talked about English language learners. We talked about our littlest folks who online learning is probably not always the best. We talked about our homeless kids. We talked about kids without co connectivity. Um, all of those would have to be carefully customized exceptions to the rule as we can figure out how to do that or if we can figure out when we can figure out how to do that. I don't know if that answers Kelsey, but um, Yeah, I did. Thank you. Um, and, and like I say, our health department um, partners offered to work with us on like custom, they call, um, Dr. Stern called them customized individual exceptions that, that we could safely execute. So those, those are things that, um, 
Kim Hankinson uh, and I can help with when, uh, when you're ready to make some of those choices of how to bring in some special ed kids, you know, and, um, you know, we want to get down to actually numbers and how to do all of that, then I'm, we're, we're available to help. Thank you, Laura. Okay, any other questions, comments, recommendations, concerns before we start working with our subgroups for today? Okay, well, um, on that note, we will ask Kelly to pop us into our um, subgroups and we will regroup um, at, a, what do you think, Kelly, 610? Yes, please. 610. We will see you at 610. That are um, visually impaired or some of our developmental preschool students with severe needs and complex IEPs. Those were just ideas of, of students that we would look at and plan for individually. And um, on our group, we have a special education teacher who actually works in the life skills, Andrea, and she was able to give some stories about, she has some students in her life skills classroom who did really well with distance learning and were able to engage and make progress on all their IEP goals. Um, so it's not a blanket statement of all students with IEPs come back, but we individually plan for each student using the data that's available. Um, next, and I need to do some work on this because the formatting decided to not work and so I will work on that and make it nice and pretty before I turn it in. Um, we would look at our students with um, complex 504 plans. And for those that are not familiar with that, 504 plans are students that are protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act who have a disability that requires some advanced planning and accommodations to meet, um, to allow them to engage in their instruction and, and education. The next would be our students with no access or internet limited technology. If they can't make, if they can't engage um, remotely and they're struggling to make progress with anything that's provided um, in maybe paper and pencil because they can't access the digital, um, we need to look at how can we provide them additional um, access. The next is our level one and level two ELL students. And those are our students that are non-native English speakers and are scoring level one or level two on the state uh, language assessment. Um, number five should be our students that are, um, are considered migrant. Again, this is where my formatting is messing up, so I'll fix that. And then our students that are experiencing homelessness. We also decided that once we, once we got a little ways down this list that we would start, um, it would start picking up multiple, or a student under multiple categories. And so as we move down the list, again, issues with my formatting, we'll fix that. Um, then we start looking at our cohorts of students that might be um, needing additional planning and that would be kindergarten, first grade, um, our sixth graders because it's a big transition year and our ninth graders, again, a big transition year. The other piece that we talked about um, is that we might have kids that are in these various categories that might not pop up on uh, people's radars. And so how do we um, create some sort of a um, way to capture the data on students that might exist in, in various categories and um, get that, that data kind of boiled down so that at the, each building level they can look at and say, what are those coexisting um, factors that might cause greater risk for a student as we get further in the um, phased in process? And, and maybe even closer to a partial reopening that we can um, make sure that we're not missing any students that have multiple risk categories. Any questions on that so far? All right, and sorry for some of the limited information. We were cutting and pasting and moving things around, so I need to add some stuff back in. Um, the next question we had was, um, what, have a plan to perform universal screening for each student um, so that the school can better understand their strengths, learning needs, and 
social emotional needs. And what I put here, and um, Faye can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Faye and Kelly and I were working on this, um, and there's some teachers and other administrators that are working on this as well, to specifically identify the screening and progress monitoring tools that we need for reading, writing, math, social, emotional, and behavior. Um, to make sure that we understand the unique needs of our students as they're coming back into the um, not really school setting right now at the in the to, back into the distance learning and we're re-engaging with them this fall to make sure that we're um, differentiating and planning for their individual needs and really understanding the impact of the school closure and this remote life we've had on our students and planning for how we're going to work with them does that make sense all right, done. So the next group, um, can we hear from the, maybe the infrastructure group next? Yeah, and I will, I'm just gonna flip, I will share my screen. Um, Michelle um, volunteered to, um, <laughs> Michelle volunteered to um, talk through. I scratched, I scratched my head with my pen. <laughs> <laughs> It works. Okay. <laughs> I have my timer. I'm ready to go. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> All right. I'm good to and start. So infrastructure. Um, same with our group. We have questions that we need to address. And so I'm just going to jump down to 17. And that was about our 180 instructional learning days that are required. And we just figured we'd go to the calendar that we've established last year but make sure to build in time to meet with families and students. Um, that kind of complements what Rebecca said with that diagnostic testing. And then a um, big part of this was to, again, we worked really hard in the spring, but we want to establish the culture of we are really in school now. So we have to be ready, create a routine. This is not that, as it says, that COVID A situation, but Online does not mean I'm gonna tune out, but I'm gonna hit the ground running and we wanna make it um, a, an, an instructional year, regardless of where we are. Um, other than that, hour 18, we had to describe our weekly schedule. Now this is probably the one that um, is a big work in progress because of what Linda just shared with the health department and what Dr. Stern is and who knows what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we know, we do know that, um, and I'm not related to him, by the way. Um, <laughs> we, I get that question now. Are you related? We are not. Um, <laughs> we did, again, based on just knowledge of students, right? Know your students. Elementary kiddos are going to need um, more time um, in terms of instructional time, at least twice a week, uh, meeting with them, connecting with them. Um, science, along with other content classes, we recognize that we need to be synchronous at least two or three times a week, but to stagger that so kids and staff and bandwidth and all of these, we're not bludgeoning too much bulky curriculum at once, and that we're kind of moving um, our practices so they complement each other, but kids are going to have a schedule where they, they know they have to do science this time in Zoom with them and then English this time in Zoom with them. And so we're complementing and not clogging up their schedules. And again, we need to start um, with distance with the curriculum because chances are we're going to work with, we're going to start online distance learning. But when we, when we transition to hybrid, we feel it's going to be a good idea to be consistent. So if we have a, an online curriculum that we're using, we transition to a hybrid model that we continue using elements of that and pulling it into that hybrid model. So students aren't all of a sudden going to be in class with different curriculum, different, different formatting, different learning management systems. The consistency is really important. So it's fluid and as seamless as possible to transition. Oh, let's see, we do a lot of, oh yeah, dedicated time here, small groups. Um, I kind of touched on that already. Uh, we need to, as teachers, make sure we chunk our time out that we get to meet with each other. Um, I think that's gonna be even more important with distance or online learning that we stay, again, that we're synchronous and we're offering a consistency and a package to students that they can um, feel safe and comfortable attempting at home and, and finishing at home. Um, however, we talked about attendance 
and attendance was, we all reached out to our kids a lot. And that meant parents got a lot of contact from, from teachers um, to the point of it being too much. So we have to figure out a way that we are taking attendance that's consistent, efficient, and not overdone. So we're not reaching out to five different, the same five kids with eight different teachers and parents and guardians aren't getting 25 emails a day from people. Cause I, I've heard from parents that was overwhelming and I'm sure it was, especially if they're at different grade levels. Um, the beauty about this though, is our flexibility. Um, we had students who were great because they were able to help their parents and watch kids in the morning and then do their homework at five o'clock at night. Um, we like the flexibility of kids who need a schedule. We'll have a schedule, but we also have a, if you need to be more flexible, then you can um, do your work later on in the day as long as you are following the um, assignments and getting your things done. Um, we want students to be able to help out with their family and then find a schedule that works for them. Yes, connectivity. Um, that's kind of addressed in another question, so I don't want to be redundant but we do need to address connectivity issues. And there is something called, is it a heat map? Yes, so that I can skip over later on. Uh, the district is figuring out who has um, connectivity issues and how to best support them, working with Whatcom County and accessing either hotspots or, or something. Um, we need to figure out how to get all kids connected because you know we cannot have um, an in equity when it turns in terms of access to those folks. Talked about that, talked about that. Um, again, schedule, right? We're gonna, some kids work great with the schedule. So we will figure out and break down for those kids. Um, this is how much time you should be spending. So they're not lost in this here, do this assignment and get it done. Uh, we will work on figuring out and chunking out time. I think we did that. We learned to do that way more successfully in the spring and kids were thankful. They're like, oh no, you've got, two hours of homework or a half an hour a day. And that way they could kind of wrap their brains around that. Uh, check in, check out, Fertil. Um, some took this check out. Oh. So we wanna make sure kids are accountable and that they are somehow checking into us. And that's either via Canvas or whatever learning management system that they have. We're gonna be using Canvas in the secondary level Google Classroom for the primary levels. I just blew through, I think, 18 and 19 um, and 20. Yes, we have learning standards. Uh, they are working or have been working in, I think this is a strength, elementary and secondary um, have established our learning standards and figured out with this giant vat of ideas and learning standards how to condense that into simple learning. Um, and that has been happening, is happening, and I'm going to say as a teacher will continue to happen. And uh, grading policies, we feel it's probably a good idea to report back to traditional grading. This keeps, in our opinion, online learning is learning. I don't, I don't want them to think because you're on a computer, you're not learning. So <laughs> traditional grading seems to be something that we best feel best supports students in the mindset of, I am back in school. Mm -hmm. Secondary team has an incomplete um, or way to uh, fill up little pockets of incompletes from the spring. Jeremy would love to mention that at a later date to you. I'm not going to, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, we got a plan. So we're going to grab those kiddos in that net and make sure they have um, the work that they need to be successful. Okay. Summer school. Uh, yes, but unfor not unfortunately, but this was something that was prioritized for the high school English and math only. Um, and those are the two uh, areas in the grade level that had summer school. I already mentioned connectivity, but I do want to add one more feature, which is really awesome. Um, district did buy 700 additional devices, and they were primarily meant to go out to fourth and fifth grade. However, with the survey coming out, and students and parents being able to opt out of using a school device, which was a pretty popular um, notion when I work with my students, then we have a better ability to then spread out more devices to more students in need and to make sure that we're intentional that we don't have 500 devices being in the sixth grade or in 10th grade so teachers are able to kind of become um, or become 
more familiar with the format of the computer that their students are working with. Professional learning, yes. We are targeting specifically the last two weeks of August. Um, we're working with FEA, or I'm working with FSD and FEA to figure out how to best prepare teachers um, and we're going to have some really good opportunities this summer and again primarily towards the end of August uh, before school starts and last but not oh I mentioned that already we do um, our um, we are using consistently secondary all canvas and elementary Google classroom as our learning management system Michelle thank you <laughs> <laughs> Bam. <laughs> Okay. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Michelle and the infrastructure team, because that was a big one with lots of pieces around um, how are we going to structure learning. And this is super important um, in spite of the information we received earlier from Linda and the health department. All right. Um, let's move on to the, um, I think, appropriate, now that we've talked about equity and access and some of the structure around schedules and grading and that type of thing to look specifically at social emotional learning. So can that team give us their update, please? Definitely. I'm going to share our, share our, we have a presentation. Um, so nice. we, <laughs> can everybody see that okay? The social emotional learning subgroup. All right, so we, um, our team looked at the social emotional learning um, needs that we will need to address coming up on this current, uh, on the 2020-2021 school year. Um, and one thing that was always at the forefront is that social emotional learning is so important um, to make sure that the needs of staff, students, and families are all being met um, in order to then meet the academic needs. Um, we had an amazing team. Sophia um, is a high school student and she's going to um, take it away from here. Hello. Um, so the cell group wanted to demonstrate how we can address each other's social emotional needs, even through Zoom meetings and how we can make them a little more interactive and, and build trust um, within Zoom communities. So we have a little activity for all of you today. Um, so can everyone look at this feelings wheel we have here? Um, it has lots of different feelings from negative to positive. And I'm going to ask all of you to pick two feelings from the outer ring of the wheel that uh, describe how you are feeling right now about um, how our task force is doing with dealing with the distance learning and what's happening with the school um, and put those feelings in the chat. So can everyone, everyone do that please? Right now. <laughs> <laughs> and so as you can see this this just helps us see how our peers and do are doing and how our colleagues are doing and it provides um, a comfortable way to talk about um, our wellness and what's going on in our lives. All right, so it looks like we have probably everybody. Great. So thank you everyone for participating. We can go on to the next slide. So here are the questions we prioritized from the OSPI template. We said, what systems or structures or tools will be revised to respond to and monitor the social, emotional, behavioral needs of students and staff? And how will we use those system structures and tools to make sure vulnerable students are being heard? Um, we also asked what aspects of school culture are most valuable and how might they be safely sustained in person or in distance learning? And what special considerations do we need to think about 
to address the cell needs of all of our unique populations. Thank you, Sophia. Um, so when brainstorming our ideas and our team, um, we really focused on three themes and the, that those three themes were connection, communication, and wellness. And um, so we're going to dive in a little bit deeper into each of those themes. Um, this picture here is a great tool that a lot of our counselors used in the spring that a lot of um, staff and students felt were really beneficial. Um, so finding ways to keep embedding those things into our daily routines will be really Really helpful to help meet the social emotional needs of our students, staff, and families. Um, another piece, it was so great hearing from the other groups so far because so much of what we're going to go over in these next couple slides really overlaps with what has already been said. So I won't spend too much time. I'll kind of skim over it, but it, it's really important things. So when looking at connections, so building those relationships and the engagement, um, our first recommendation is to really have kind of a two to three week slow start before we really dig into the academic content. Um, so having that universal screener in place um, where we can really find out how summer went for our students, um, what, how their emotional well-being is, um, and having this for preschool through 12th grade, um, being able to focus on individual staff contact with family and students during this first two to three weeks. Um, potential, this could be phone calls, potentially doing home visits um, if it's safe to do so um, and if people are comfortable with that. Um, making sure that our students are trained in technology that they're going to be using for distance learning so that it eases some of that anxiety that could be there. Um, and then also using those first two to three weeks to meet classmates and teachers through engaging Zoom meetings um, and using our social emotional curriculum that we have both at the um, elementary and at the uh, middle and high school. So second step at the elementary and then character strong at the high school level. Our second recommendation under connections is um, having time that's devoted, and this was already addressed also in one of the other subgroups, but having um, time devoted to have that ongoing communication with um, family and students. Um, one idea that we had was to make one day a week um, where there's no staff meetings that are scheduled or other meetings. That way um, staff can really dedicate that time to reach out to families and to students. Um, and then our third recommendation under this theme is to have um, classified staff paired with individual teachers. Um, and this would just help with that extra support and coaching. Um, it, provide, it would provide extra supervision during Zoom meetings and breakout rooms. Um, and then it also help with that meaningful work piece for staff. The next theme that we looked at was communication. And for this, our first recommendation, and this was also addressed, is having just less people and clearer communication. So having that contact person be the, the student's primary contact teacher. Um, this could be the advisory teacher at the high school level. Um, and then also for our second recommendation is having a shared um, call log for all staff that work with that student. Um, we found many times in the spring where families would say, oh, I just had somebody call me about that. Like I already have been asked that five times. So if we had a shared call log where we could be recording that information, it would help ease some of the frustration that some families may have been having. And then our last theme that we looked at was wellness. And for that, our first recommendation um, was to increase phone support and then also small groups for students and parents. Um, one thing that was a big success in the spring um, or that a lot of people felt really supported by was having this the parent SOS program um, that was put on by the counselors. Um, the one thing that we noted though is that there were several people in our small subgroup that hadn't heard of it and so we really want to make sure that we increase advertising for that um, and the communication that goes out to that. Um, and then also having some type of open phone line available during school hours um, where families could call in, whether it was for tech support or for support with social emotional learning or with behavior. Um, and then that person could then 
direct their questions to the per to the support staff that would be able to help them. Um, and then our second recommendation for that is just making sure that we continue having accountability partners for staff and students. And this is really to help support making sure that staff are putting boundaries on their time, um, having physical, emotional self-care goals and check-ins, wellness, um, self-care content at each staff meeting. Um, that was a really big, um, that was the thing that a lot of people appreciated at staff meetings last year was having those wellness self-care check-ins um, and then also distributing mindfulness content um, out to staff and students. And then our last area that we had, we just had some ideas that we thought were pretty brilliant um, and deserve some honorable mentions. And so those were um, one um, common theme that we heard what that was a frustration in the spring from families is um, just how do I motivate my child um, their just behavior concerns um, so putting in some type of parent feedback um, form on a weekly basis um, where parents can uh, can um, report back on the student's attitude, their motivation at home, create some type of tracking form that parents can report. Um, this could help with setting and tracking goals for their students. Um, another thing that we talked about is that if we are in person and we're wearing masks, that can be really um, unsettling to some students. And so maybe wearing buttons that have a picture of the staff members with a, of that person smiling just so that they know exactly what that person looks like without the mask on. Um, and then the big thing is having that universal screen Screening. Um, and so we really need to dig in who is going to be doing this um, and that, that that social emotional learning piece that screener is just as important as the academic screeners um, and then continuing our message of the you me we even in distance learning and that's it and this is all of the members on our the social emotional learning task force it was a really great group to work with thank you everyone all right, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I can tell there's a lot of um, heart and connection to the content that was being worked on in the social emotional learning group. I really appreciate your presentation. And um, I think that uh, we all share a lot of the, um, the need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves and each other in this time, because I don't know about you guys, but this has been, I think, trying for all members of our family, our work family and our home families. And so thank you very much for that work. All right, our facilities and operations group. Who's going? Oh, we don't have, um, I don't like going behind cell because <laughs> we don't have a fancy, um, you know, PowerPoint. Um, That's all right. John, will you, you share your screen and Sarah has graciously agreed to uh, be our point person for um, sharing our answers to our question. You'll notice the very clean lines of the black and white on the screen. <laughs> Not very fancy, but uh, we'll get to the point. Sarah, are you ready? Sorry, I'm ready. We will make okay. it fancy in time for a larger presentation, fear you not. <laughs> So um, our first question was just that we have identified somebody at uh, the local health office and we obviously know Dr. Stern is doing a lot of informing as far as wh which direction the district is moving, but we also have been working with Kim um, Hankinson, the nurse that was on last week, and then Lorette Rasmussen, who's an environmental health specialist. So all of those people will be um, helping us a great deal as we go through this year. The next question was just, um, ensuring that we have all reviewed the CDC guidelines and the definition of high-risk employees, and then that we have clearly communicated that with staff, and indeed we have. We've pasted those here. I'm not going to go through them. I think we all know about the risk factors for COVID and severe COVID disease, um, but what our plan with this is to actually have a survey that all staff um, will do to allow them to identify themselves as high-risk and do so in a confidential way. Um, so the next question was about a daily health screening plan. Um, this is a little bit of a moving target, but we have a, a agreed um, to use a certain company, Qualtrics, I think is what it's called, to provide a daily attestation that parents and teachers and everyone that's going to have any contact with anyone in the school system will be doing. Um, that will link with, I'm sorry, what's it called? The Skyward. 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 Yep. Um, 
to allow us to easily identify those that have not done the attestation each day um, and make sure that those kids are screened hopefully before they enter the building and we're still a little bit of a moving target is how we're going to deal with transportation and children that have not done the attestation but that's something we've been talking and brainstorming a great deal about and we will continue to do so hopefully we'll have some um, answers by the time we have any big meeting uh, the next piece is um, just that we have clearly estab established procedures um, in coordination with the local health authority. And we know exactly what to do as far as how to report any suspected or known cases of COVID-19 within the district. And um, luckily there is a flow chart or decision tree that's going to be published by the health department in the next few days. And we very much plan to use that decision tree uh, we want to make it clear to everyone that asks us exactly what will be done should there be a suspect. Um, and, um, and, and I think at each school, we've, we've said it's going to go down to the school level, then up to a higher district level, then to the health department. And it will not be the nurse. Um, the nurse's job will be many other things, but not this reporting job. She will be involved, however. Um, so for the next few questions, we kind of skipped over some of these, didn't we guys? Um, as far as the classrooms, I know that the district has been working incredibly hard this summer to visit every single classroom and ensure that six feet of physical distance is possible. And we know the maximum amount of students that can actually attend class in each of the rooms and do so in a safe way. Um, the way that our group has worked is we know what's safe and we're going to make sure that that's very clearly um, outlined and we will make sure that none of our students or staff are put in an unsafe situation. Um, so that mapping has been done all, all the way down to tons of details that we're not asked about here. Um, the next piece is about frequent hand washing. And again, this is something that we're working really hard to establish and making sure that there is a hand washing, hand washing station as someone enters a new space so that every student or staff who enters a new space it will be able to either use hand sanitizer or wash with soap and water um, and everything that goes with that. So sort of a gel in, gel out um, protocol. As far as face coverings, I think it's very clear we will recommend them for everyone in, 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 as the Department of Health and LNI recommend. Um, with the very, very few exceptions. Um, yeah, and for transportation, um, physical distancing on their, we have a specific group that's been working on those transportation issues and I don't know if they wanna speak to any of these, but I know that they're working on every other seed and figuring out how to map um, pickup of kids to allow for distancing on the buses. Um, it will include assigned seats and hopefully skipping um, rows to keep it as safe as possible. Um, and that our buses and our, our facilities are routinely cleaned um, as recommended by the Department of Health. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> That's it for our group. So this, is, so this is Renetta. And can you go back up to number 11 on that same slide? John. Was that John? Yep, John shared his screen. So I've been I've been anointed the food service speaker because Holly's data doesn't work very well. <laughs> Convenient. I know. How funny is that, huh? So if you go back up to that slide, we'll talk about number eleven, which was the one about food services. But while you're while you're pulling that up, there's a couple things that I wanted that that we wanted to bring up. Um, OSPI and uh, the and um, USDA are not going to allow us to anonymously uh, give out food coming uh, in the fall. So we are we're going to have to track all the meals to a student. Um, it can still be picked up by a parent, but it has to be tracked to a student, and it has to be tracked by day. So our our current plan, if we go uh, distance learning, is to deliver or is to provide. Um, a five breakfast, five lunch box once a week that will then be tracked to a student and um, put into Skyward so we can track the meals. At this point, they're not going to allow us, which was which is pretty sad because 
I think that gave us a lot of credibility in the in the um, in the community that we were feeding their students because it, you know a lot of them needed the food. So um, so anyway, if you go back up to here, so this is this is the plan. If we're going back to school, we will have altered uh, physical spaces, um, and we will provide meals to the students, and we will do the six feet distancing. The plan is to do grab and go. Everything will be prepackaged or wrapped in the classroom or designated physical distance space. For elementary schools, meals will be delivered to classroom. For secondary students, a schedule could be developed for students to pick up for food, then return to the classroom where they can sit physically distance. Um, cafeterias and secondary schools will have designated food lines with physical distance markings to ensure students can keep physically distance while waiting in line to pick up their meal. Um, we will work with secondary administrators to develop meal schedules to accommodate the plans and work with facilities to work out the details of the food lines. Staff serving students and working the point of sale systems will be distanced behind a table and a point of, say, a, a point of sale station wearing a mask and a face shield. So food services, um, the Department of Labor and Industry is requiring food services to wear a disposable mask and a face shield does not replace a mask. So um, anybody have any questions? Oh, the other thing I wanted to point out, um, I think it's extremely important and we're gonna try to do this is one of the things that some of the, especially the older students, that their parents didn't apply for uh, free and reduced um, meal applications as in the high school because why bother? Their kids, their kids, their kids weren't eating. Um, so those students have missed out on the PEVT funds. So we need to encourage students to apply for um, free and reduced. Thank you, Renetta. I think that's a really good point to bring up is that there's so many services that are, are connected with identifying the, the families and the students that need those additional resources. And a, um, I think a communication campaign to make sure that we're reaching out to our families and helping our families and our kids understand the importance of that is going to be um, key over the next couple of weeks as we get ready to um, start up schooling systems in what may be a more remote situation, right? Um, Rebecca, Rebecca yeah. yeah, we have 10 minutes until a bunch of us are going to have to exit to get on the school board. Correct. Meeting. Yep. This is the last group and it's the communication group. So Linda, it's your group and, and um, Aaron and who do you have representing your group? I thought, I thought there was still Paul. Yes, yeah, so I have a, I need to <clears throat> step up here. And um, so <clears throat> we had a under the operations and maintenance and the transportation section, we had a pretty good glide path going uh, to opening school. And a uh, shout out to Laureate for helping me last week uh, to discuss how best to get children loaded on buses and get them off buses. And we, um, I developed two different possible plans. Um, and a couple other things that we were doing uh, reference with transportation and making sure that we were doing the right thing. However, with, with the, the fact, fact that, that we, um, um, hang on, I'm, yeah, I'm getting feedback, stand by. Yeah, you're logged in in two locations, it looks like. Oh, All I right. just muted you in one place, you're good. Keep okay. going. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the um, fact of what, has, what is transpiring right now, and it deals with transportation funding, that there's a high probability that some type of furlough is going to occur. There's another, uh, there's the possibility, the probability that we will have to keep a small contact team of drivers to be able to handle the high need students and students that might have trouble getting connected, helping them get to where they're going to their school so they can get some type of connectivity depending on how uh, that plays out. Um, it, so some transportation requirements going to be available. Currently we have uh, approximately about 55, about 50 actual, well, 45 contracted bus positions. And here in about 30 days, we're supposed to have our annual in-service where we make sure everybody 
is trained up and we also do route bidding. And with uh, the distance learning option uh, for the entire fall quarter, we're gonna be, we don't know what, the, what it will look like for the bidding. If we're only gonna bid 10 routes that the 10 senior drivers get. And this is a larger question that has to be answered by OSPI and it gets down to transportation funding. Because the, if we lose transportation dollars, then we really don't have any ability to pay any of our drivers to transport students. And so we are sitting on a moving objective here at transportation. And um, we've already started this discussion last Friday, Mark and I, uh, the, with the Teamsters uh, board this morning and with John Fairburn this morning and more to follow on that. And um, that's all I have at this time uh, with the transportation piece. All right, thank you, Paul. Paul, I would just add that it, transportation was a major topic of conversation with the superintendents today. Um, I don't know how it'll turn out, but there's a lot of lobbying going on to, for, the, for the legislature to, to change and do some sort of mitigation um, so that we don't lose all of our drivers. So before, I don't wanna say any more, but there are a lot of people talking about how, what's gonna happen there. And anyway. That, that's great because uh, one thing coming in at, in February of 2019 that I've noticed is that somewhere along the lines, Ferndale has been doing a good job with the drivers and keeping them on board. So we have a very experienced crew. If we furlough all of them for uh, the first quarter, there's a good chance we won't get that experienced team back. And that we will be a loss for us. We recognize that. We're working on that. Yeah. Um, I think Rebecca right. Communications was last. Yep. Aaron, can you do a three minute report? Erin, are you still here? She may have left. She's in charge of um, opening up the school board meeting. I, I think we can just say that we answered yes to all the questions. We talked about ways we can communicate. We put a special attention on um, talking about ways we can communicate with special populations, um, particularly our non-English speaking populations. It's great to have Rav and Alvaro in that group. Um, we have a plan and we will share more. We will share more next week. I, we just can't afford not to um, get the school board meeting started. Kind All right. Of on yes. So we have a number of members that are going to be leaving our meeting now to log into a different uh, meeting for the school board. I really appreciate all of the work and all of the feedback. Um, make sure that your notes get um, uploaded into the shared Google Drive for those facilitators so that we can uh, work on pulling this plan together um, into one cohesive document and get it ready for um, preview next week. Again, thank you all for all your time and your energy and your incredible dedication and your amazing ideas. Um, we're going to be ready to start remote, in-person, hybrid, whatever it is that we need to do because we have an amazing team behind us. So thank you all for your time, and we will see you next week, if not before. Take care. Thanks, everybody. See you.